St Andrews lies along the eastern coast of Scotland. You might think of it as the birthplace of golf, but there have been far more interesting competitions that have actually gone on within the bounds of this beautiful Scottish city. Today, within the chemistry department of St Andrews University, there continues to be a competition of ideas, ideas about science, and ideas about what science can tell us about our world, its meaning, and its creator. We're going to meet one of the professors who works in this department, Dr. John Walton, an eminent scientist and a deep thinker. While I was doing my PhD, the role of electrons in chemistry was beginning to be understood and appreciated a lot more. There were good theories, good quantum mechanical based theories about how charged species, cations and anions, behaved in chemical reactions. But there were also neutral species called free radicals. They were generally considered to be ungovernable, uninteresting and um, not, not very important. So my PhD was to try and change all that, to discover what were the major reactions of free radicals, how they behaved, and could we develop some conceptual tools so that we could uh, understand how to predict what they would do and to utilize the free, free radicals in, in some useful ways. Free radicals are atoms and molecules that have a single electron that is unpaired with another electron. Because electrons are much more stable when paired, the single unpaired electron in a free radical is extremely reactive. And these chemicals tend to react very readily with other chemicals. When I was quite a young boy, my father was very interested in science and um, we lived in an ordinary suburban semi-detached house, but he had got a laboratory up on the, up on the top level, or upstairs, and he filled it with uh, bottles of chemicals. He had beautiful large blue crystals of copper sulfate and um, clear crystals of alums and so on. And um, us boys weren't allowed to go in there except when he was there and he would sometimes show us but of course we, we when he was out we would peep in there and sniff the um, amylacetate which was pear drops and sometimes we'd open a bottle of ammonia for example and get a terrible uh, get a terrible smell and um, then he would set up a table on the bath in our bathroom and he'd con connect a condenser to the uh, to the tap and he'd do an, do an experiment in the bath in the bathroom maybe a reflux or a or a distillation or something like that. Um, so all this kind of fascinated me from the earliest age with, uh, with science and particularly with chemistry. And sometimes we would make hydrogen and uh, out in the garden and then we'd collect it in a test tube and you hold the test tube in, into a Bunsen burner and it makes, a, it makes a quite a, a loud bang. And of course, we enjoyed doing that no end as well. So all, all these things made me interested in science and particularly in chemistry. It's one of the most central sciences that there are. On one side you have biology and medicine and chemistry feeds into those. On the other side you have physics and mathematics. Chemistry feeds into those. There's material science, engineering on another side, geoscience on another side. So chemistry is right in the middle. It's able to contribute in all these different areas. So the opportunities are uh, huge. And what's more, with chemistry, you have the opportunity to help make society a better place, uh, a more livable place, a safer place and a healthier place. So all, all those things contributed to making me want to go for chemistry. At the moment, there are two or three projects that I'm working on. 
One involves bicarbonate radicals. When we breathe out, we breathe out carbon dioxide and it dissolves in fluids in our body to give carbonate and bicarbonate. And because of the enzymes that are present, the bicarbonate is converted into bicarbonate radicals. And in the, in the body, radicals, they can be positive, they can do positive things, they can kill invading uh, microorganisms, but also they can damage, particularly lipids and atherosclerosis and other, uh, other such diseases result. Atherosclerosis is hardening of the arteries associated with fat deposits, and it's a common cause of sickness and death. We're studying the bicarbonate radicals and other reactive oxygen species to try and find out why. We're going to look at the surface of our LDL particles using a technique called atomic force microscopy. We're going to study the surfaces before they're attacked by free radicals and after to see what changes have happened. Maybe the cholesterol molecule has changed. Maybe the lipids in the, in the LDL particle have changed in some way. Can we recognize what it is that's uh, making the macrophages engulf them and, and not other kinds of, um, of species that, that, that are present there? And we hope that we can find biomarkers, for example, and means of remedying the, uh, the effects of the damage to the lipids that free radicals can cause. That's the long-term aim. I went to Watford Grammar School and uh, it was a traditional English grammar school. Most of the masters there were ex-forces, ex-RAF, ex-army. Uh, and they'd fought against the Nazis in the war. The headmaster, for example, had been in the French resistance during the war. As a conservative Christian coming into that, from a family that had been conscientious objectors, that is, wouldn't take part in, in combat, it was definitely uh, unpopular. I think the, the masters all tried to be as fair and as objective as possible, but it was quite clear that you wouldn't be picked for responsible roles. There were barriers and of course amongst the boys, conchies as, as they were called, were very unpopular. They were regarded as cowards and unpatriotic. But you did have to you know, stand firm for what you believed and, and, and shrug off the fact that uh, you wouldn't always, uh, you, you wouldn't get much preferment. And my parents were strong conservative Christians. That was a, a big influence in my life for sure. But also, I was influenced by a couple of ministers in the church, W. W. Armstrong and A. K. Armstrong. W. W. Armstrong was a leader in the, in the church that I attended, and uh, he'd suffered terribly for being a conscientious objector in the First World War, being imprisoned, being brutally treated. A. K. Armstrong was a very impressive person, wrote hymns that uh, we still sing occasionally. They had a, a powerful influence on me, I would say, uh, as examples as ro and role models. Then I've always been an avid reader, read C.S. Lewis, made a, huge, made a huge impact on me. I read a lot of books about archaeology, particularly archaeology and the Bible. And when, again, when I was a boy, the Dead Sea Scrolls were just being published. So it seemed that uh, all the remarks of the skeptics were being refuted by one discovery after another came out which, which refuted what they were saying and seemed to confirm that the conservative Christian uh, point of view was, was the right one. So I stayed with my faith until I got to university. I went to Sheffield University. Sir George Porter, the Nobel Laureate, was head of a chemistry department there at the time, and he was a particularly gifted experimentalist, but also a very gifted speaker and lecturer, and taught me about thermodynamics and statistical thermodynamics in a very, uh, very approachable way. At that time, quantum mechanics was just coming to be appreciated in chemistry, so quantum chemistry was a, a speciality at Sheffield University and I think I was just rather lucky to go to a place where that, that 
was something that was emphasised. I started doing my doctorate, my PhD, at Sheffield University and I chose a supervisor there, Dr John Tedder. He subsequently became Lord Tedder, who I respected and who I thought was working in an area that would be interesting for me but would also help me to get a good job. And he migrated with his whole group to Dundee and I went with him and helped him set up his research group there at, at Queen's College and that's where I, I finished my, uh, my PhD. Dr. Walton's discoveries about free radicals involves an understanding of electrons, and electrons are about as tiny as you can get. But how do these little tiny particles and our understanding of them impact Dr. Walton's understanding of himself and the world in which he lives. You know, St Andrews has got such a historical ambience to it. There are lots of monuments for martyrs, saints, sinners as well, beautiful churches like Holy Trinity and also this St. Salvator's Chapel that we're sitting in at the moment. When you think of the prayers that have risen in this place, the beautiful music, the hymns that have been sung, the psalms that have been sung here, it's definitely inspiring. And there were individuals who gave their lives for their beliefs here too, like Patrick Hamilton, at one time a student in the university, came back to St Andrews after being influenced by Luther and while still a member of the university was burned at the stake right outside this building. He stood for his faith, he stood for freedom of conscience, he stood for freedom of speech, he maintained his integrity in spite of the threat and actual execution of death. And it's quite an inspiration to me and I know to others as well to uh, recognise that if you believe in something, then it's worth standing for, it's worth making the most extreme stand for. I attended a Bible study classes almost every week, got to know the Bible very well, and um, was able to contradict, even from a very young age, many of the absurd statements that people make about it being a book of fables and full of errors and so on. At least until I reached university age, uh, I was happy to be a conservative Christian in the same denomination as my parents. One thing that, that always has impressed me about uh, Christianity is that it offers the opportunity for eternal life. I've always felt that life is much too short to do all the things that one wants to do. If you work out the number of books, if you read five books a, re a week, you can still only read maybe 60 or 70,000 books in a lifetime. And even a small library has a million books now. If there is no such thing as eternal life, then really everything in this world becomes meaningless. I'll soon be forgotten. I mean, everybody that, that, that dies, they're soon forgotten. If there is no tomorrow, if there's no eternal life, essentially, Everything you do is, is really only of momentary interest and, and it'll be gone. So that's something about Christianity that uh, always attracted me very strongly. If there is eternal life, then these things will always be remembered. Your discoveries, all the great works of art, they won't just go to dust. They will be remembered and treasured forever. There were, many, there were many challenges to my faith while I was uh, getting my education. In particular, in those days we had many intense discussions amongst students about faith, about religion, about origins, about creation and evolution. There wasn't the same pressure to conform in those days. You could talk about creation, you could talk about origins without facing quite the ostracism and the um, ridicule that you, do, that you do nowadays, so discussions like that were much freer. I do remember on one occasion having a, 
discussion along those lines with some fellow students and a fellow uh, student brought in to show me a textbook and in the textbook was a clear picture of Heckel's embryos where the embryos of fish and birds and mammals and human beings are compared with one another and they look very similar and uh, he showed me this and said look here it shows how we recapitulate our evolutionary history and it did make quite an impression on me they looked so similar I started to wonder if there could be something uh, to ev evolution after all and it was quite a number of years before I discovered that in fact Heckel had fraudulently changed the embryos to be much more similar to one another than they really are. It's sad that those same embryo pictures are still being used in biology textbooks and in, in programs to support the theory of evolution when it's well known, well established, that in fact they're fraudulent. Some of the research I do uh, does have a bearing on um, creation and faith. Uh, in particular, the oxygen that we breathe every day is itself a free radical. It oxidizes materials in our body, and reacts rapidly with foodstuffs, and that's, along with microorganisms, is one of the reasons why they degrade so rapidly and have short shelf lives. Of course, it reacts with lipids in our bodies as well and, and uh, degrades them. This degradation process that oxygen brings about is absolutely universal and it happens in nature and of course this is one of the reasons why evolutionists have to propose that the atmosphere, the world's atmosphere, once had no oxygen in it otherwise organic molecules could never have existed on the surface of the earth they would have degraded far too rapidly on a geological scale but the idea that there was never any oxygen in the atmosphere didn't make sense to me because the earth's crust is made up of 46% oxygen. It's the most abundant element in the crust of the Earth. How could the Earth's atmosphere, in contact with oxygen-containing rocks and the ocean, ever be completely devoid of oxygen? It never made sense to me. Furthermore, if there had been no oxygen, then there would be no ozone layer, and if there were no ozone layer, hard ultraviolet from the sun would reach the surface of the Earth, and it would fertilize the water in the sea to produce oxygen, which would build up rapidly on any kind of geological time scale. So the idea of an oxygen-free atmosphere just never hung together as far as I was concerned. One of the little appreciated facts about chemistry is the stupendous size of the totality of possible chemical compounds, what's called chemical space. Uh, if you just take 30 atoms and combine them in all possible ways, you can make a total of about 10 to the power 24 different molecules from that collection of 30 atoms. 10 to the power 24. That's about the same number as there are stars in the known universe. Most pharmaceuticals are much bigger than 30 atoms, and it's been estimated that there are 10 to the power 60, somewhere in that region, of possible pharmaceuticals. They call this chemical space. It's a virtual reality, a virtual chemical space, but it's far larger than um, astronomical space. Now, when it comes to DNA, DNA is composed of various units and a typical strand of DNA in a living system will be thousands of these units long and these units can be combined in various different ways far more ways than the 10 to the power 60 that I mentioned a minute ago for chemical space there are far more possible strands of DNA than 10 to the power 60. How is some random process, some undirected process, ever going to find in that enormous volume of chemical space just the few DNA molecules that are appropriate for the start of life or to keep life going? It seems an impossible task. Even if all the world's expertise in all the world's laboratories working at top rate, as long as civilization exists, could never explore all of pharmaceutical space. 
How is a random process ever going to be able to find just those few DNA molecules that are appropriate for life? Or the few protein molecules, exactly the same argument applies there as well. It seems quite an impossible task. A, a miracle would be needed for just the right ones to be discovered in that, uh, in that huge variety. The inference has to be that there must have been a mind that coded, that prepared the information that's present in the DNA. It's one of the strongest arguments in favour of the idea that a creator both designed the sequences and made the original ones. In a way you can think about science as a quest for eternal truths, the eternal laws of physics. Dr. Walton's contribution to our understanding of the laws of nature cannot be understated. Free radicals are really important in chemistry. But there are other important questions that everybody struggles with in life. Is there a God? Where did we come from? Why are we here? I found Dr. Walton's thoughts on these large metaphysical questions to be both fascinating and encouraging.